So quickly what we did in the children's church and why we did it. Um, we realized that our children were exhibiting certain traits that we didn't think were wholesome. And so we took a poll. We asked them to tell us anonymously questions they would like to ask their parents which they have not been able to ask and to tell us why. Um, we didn't let them write their names. We just let them write their ages and their gender, whether they were male or female. So um, the questions you will see scrolling are the questions the children asked. We beg you, parents, please don't go home and, you know, hold them by the ears or by the shoulders or anywhere and force them to tell you whether they asked or who asked what. Even they don't know who asked what questions. And we don't know who asked what questions. We only know their ages and we know that they're either a boy or a girl. And all the questions are from the pre-teens and teens class. Thank you. And I have these questions. I'm 13 years old. I'm a girl. I want my parents to understand that I'm a depressed child. Some might say I'm suicidal. I'm bisexual and it's uncomfortable. I feel alone and my parents won't understand. I want you to help me, but you won't understand. She wrote that to me. I haven't told my parents because I'm not comfortable to tell my parents. Because when I told my mom that I was bisexual, she just, you know, pushed it aside. And she didn't care. I have told her I have sleep paralysis, but she ignores it as well. I can't tell my parents because they won't understand me. I'm going to direct this question to Pastor Laulu. And um, in your experience, please share with us. Praise the Lord. First of all, I want to um, explain to the church why we're having this forum today. Because if we had it on Saturday, nobody would come. And we felt that these ch questions needed to be heard. Because these are questions that have come from your children. We haven't taken them from a church outside. We've taken them from this church, Guiding Light Assembly. And these are things that are going on in your children's lives that you probably have absolutely no idea about. And when I read through some of these questions, I must confess I was almost traumatized because these children are walking around seemingly happy-go-lucky, um, but they're going through these things. If a child has been raped, she needs to be able to tell her mother or her father but she also needs to be believed. We've heard these things from ages past that parents never believe when their children tell them it's either your fault or you're deluded or it's not true. And usually children are raped by people who are close to them in the house, either a relative or staff or somebody. And um, we cannot continue to sweep these things under the carpet. Amen. If we've missed it before, it's time to address it. Because our children are living these things. Depressed, suicidal, and you don't know why. And probably your first reaction is to either beat them, or slap them, or shout. And this is reality. I remember many years ago, I used to shout at my children all the time, especially the boys. And one day my daughter said to me, Mommy, your shouting has, doesn't do anything, so why do you shout? Anyway, so I stopped shouting and employed other means. Amen. Such as prayer. Now, a 13-year-old girl thinks she's bisexual. I don't want to say she's bisexual. She thinks she's bisexual. Who can talk to her about it? Who can she confide in? It has to be her mother. It has to be the parent who can talk to the child and explain to her about her sexuality and um, get to know what exactly she's going through. Because it must be quite hard for a child who is 13 to think she's bisexual. And she hears in church, she hears at home, she hears in school that it's the devil, it's evil, it's not of God. Which, you know, is probably, probably true. But from where she's standing, it's a reality. They say perception 
is real. It may, it may not be reality, but perception is real to the person who is going through it. So I think parents, we need to be able to talk to our children and give them a chance. Communication, I believe, is the key. If they can come to you about anything, no fear of judgment or condemnation. The first thing you do shouldn't be, well, shut up. Who told you? It's not true. And then she's never going to come and tell you anything else. And she's going to go through it on her own. This child says she's told her mother, and her mother, she guesses, doesn't care. I'm sure it's not that the mother doesn't care. The mother probably doesn't know what to do. So even parents need help. But you need to open the channels of communication and be able to talk. Thank you, Pastor Lalo. Please, does anybody want to add to that? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I, I think that sometimes as parents, um, we, we panic when we hear our children say some things. We don't know what to do. And it's in a way for, for parents, it can be a form of denial or escapism where if I just pretend it didn't happen, then somehow it will resolve itself. Uh, but then 10, 20 years down the line, the, the fruit starts to come out. One of the things I would encourage parents to do is to ask the hard questions. Um, if, if children are clearly struggling to say things because of the way they expect we would react, then maybe we as parents need to take the initiative and start um, asking hard questions. I once um, went out to the movies with one of my sons, and by the way, it's nice to have outings with one child at a time, even if you have a lot, whole lot of them. And right in the middle of the movie, I just said, sweetheart, are you gay? He screamed, like, how could you ask me such a question? I said, because if you were, I'd probably be the last to know, so I might as well ask you. I'm not asking you because I've seen anything, but as parents, unless we're vigilant, we're usually the last to know. So just ask the hard questions. Just ask, have you been raped? Are you gay? Has anybody ever touched you where you don't want to be touched? I just ask the hard questions because it's not going to go away. Whether you deal with it now or you're dealing with it 10, 20 years down the road, somebody's going to have to face the consequences of whatever is going on. So. Thank you. I, so I go on to another question quickly. And Brother Ted, this is for you. He says, I'm a boy, I'm 13 years old. My parents flog me about books, i.e. because I'm not doing well in class. Um, another 11-year-old boy says, I'm a boy, I'm 11-year-old. I wish my parents would tell me, talk to me about things that disturb me in school. And I wish my parents would let us go out as a family more often. Brother Ted. Let me just say a few things about my, uh, some of my views about um, children and parenting. My father was a, uh, was a pastor, and also he, um, you know, he didn't live with us for a, you know, a, lot, a lot of time. He was uh, a lecturer as well, so he was a lot of time out, out of the house. <clears throat> I remember when I left, uh, finished uh, NYC, so we're not very close, uh, just to put it simply. When I left NYC, of course I was not born again, so that's why we were so not, not close, because I was on the other side. But after I left NYC, I was born again at that time, and uh, he came up one day and he said uh, he wanted to go to buy uh, shoes. I should come with him. And I looked at him, uh, when did we start talking about going to pick shoes for you? But I could see the pain in his heart that he wanted to be close to me. But time was gone. Time was gone. And I said to myself, no matter what I do, uh, this will never happen to me. Um, and so that's sort of the foundation for a lot of things that I have sort of done in life. Now, with my son talking about uh, not, uh, you know, not doing well in school, I remember once uh, something was happening to my son. I think he wasn't being quite as serious as I thought he should be. And to be honest, I was, uh, I was that unserious when I was his age. And like uh, Antibola said, I was scared that he was going to become like me. And I said, you have to be serious. And, but I was taking it out on him. I was getting very angry with him about not being serious. But what was really fueling that anger was my insecurity. That I was going to turn out, you know, the way I didn't want him to turn out. 
And one day I was getting very angry with him, and the Lord said to me, He said, If I get angry with you the way you get angry with him, where will you be? That was a turning point. Uh, because I just said to myself, I mean, I mean, I do so many things sort of wrong that if the Lord were to pick on me for everything I don't do well, I mean, I don't have a life. And the scripture for that really is this it says, A father disciplines a son that he loves. Now, look at the sequence. A father disciplines a son that he loves. You first have to love the son before the discipline. You first have to love the son before the, or the child before the discipline. And what the Lord said to me was, begin to love him. And I, in fact, begin to love him. As you begin to love him, that discipline will be a lot easier. You beat a child you don't like. That's really what it is. But you first love the child, then you can apply discipline to the child. The second thing he said to me with that experience was, he said to me that the, what you are scared of, begin to deal with it in your life. Whatever it is you, you are scared of, your children or your son, your daughter is going to manifest, that if you, if you deal with the, with, the, with the seed, with the root, the fruit will not manifest. And I said, but God, I mean, he's already a child. I mean, he's already, probably was about a teenager at that time. And he said, no, it's a spiritual principle. Deal with it. There are some unfinished business you need to deal with in your life. Deal with it. You will start seeing a different fruit manifest. And then, to God's glory, that's what I did. As I started doing that, I started seeing a different thing manifest in him. So I think it's important for us to understand that um, it's God wants us, first of all, to love them. And then you can apply the discipline that you, you really want to, uh, uh, to apply. I think the other thing to, um, to also say about uh, you know, communication is just spend time. So one of the things I said to, uh, I tell my, friend, my record by friends that back then was, one of the hap my happiest days as a parent was the day my son came to me and said, uh, it was probably about 12, 13, said, Dad, how can I get a six-pack? I was ex extremely excited because when I was his age, those are not questions you talk to your parents about. You go and ask your friends, you go and ask, you, I mean, in fact, you don't even let your, your father know that you have a six pack. Right? So, but it was a, a time of, it, was, it came from that reflection that, look, I really want to spend time with him. I really want to, him to be my friend, but also to discipline him. So, not just being my friend, but that we can talk about things together. So, as he grew, I mean, I remember about two weeks ago, I was back at home and I was telling them some things that I did when I was in university. They said, Dad, why didn't you tell us that? I said, because at that age, you won't understand. So there's a prog progressive revelation as well. You don't tell them everything that you did because they won't understand. They think you're a very bad person. So as, I, as they grow up, you tell them, okay, I did this one. For example, there was once I told them, I think about my, uh, how I used to see my father's perfume. That if I, you know, he, had, he was using old, old Spice back in the days. Now, Old Spice is very, quite strong. So what I will do, don't learn this if you're a child. What I'll do is that I'll take the take my shirt outside to the um, to the garden and hang it. When I'm going out, they say, "Aren't you going to? Aren't you wearing anything to go out?" I say, uh, well, "I'll take my shirt in the in the, uh, it's, in, it's, in the it's, it's hanging outside. I'll take the perfume outside. I will spray the perfume, and then go out. Of course, when you come back, you hang you hang the shirt outside again, and you come back inside. And of course, those are the kind of things you talk about with them, and they'll tell you some of the things that the ones they want to tell you that they've also done. But I think." It's just knowing that you have to love them first before you discipline them. Praise the Lord. Very much. I think um, what we're saying here is that rather than flog the child because he's not doing well in school, we can start by asking them or finding out why that child is not performing in school and then deal with the issue. And if it is that the child is um, not serious, what I've learned from what um, Brother Ted said is that, you know, sometimes we wear like that and we are afraid that our children may turn out to be like that too, so we take it out on them. And sometimes it's counterproductive. I'll read the next question quickly. Uh, Mr. Wuni, this is for you. Sometimes I feel God is not there and I start to lose faith. And I can understand that it might be the devil tempting me. But if I tell my parents, they just tell me not to worry about it. Now this is where this child was growing, going. It's a 14-year-old girl. 
so that you'll understand. She says, I don't know if it is okay to grind a boy. I'm sure many parents don't know what it means to grind. I will explain because she said it here. Grinding is a kind of dance where the boy is at the back and the girl is in front. So she's backing him and he is behind her. Um, yeah. Grind a boy like dance with him and I'm in front and he's behind me. So he has access. She's 14 years old. Don't exclaim. Everybody's They've gasping. been dancing that dance since they were 10. And a lot of parents don't know. The first time I saw it, my eyes popped. I nearly fainted. Brother Wooney, <laughs> if your daughter came with this question. Now she's questioning the existence of God. But I think her real question is, what I'm doing, is it okay? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Like the other panelists have said, when we read through these questions, honestly, I was perturbed. That could this actually be, be going on? And for real, they are. Now, I will start from the beginning that we should go to the origin. And that is with the parents, first of all. God gave these children to us. It's as if they have a blank heart, like a, like a board. It is whatever we now, by our acts of commission or omission, it is how we bring them up that they begin to write things there. For example, Proverbs 22 verse 6 says, Teach a child the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Now, when children look at us, particularly during our unguided moments, they learn a lot not only from what we say, from what we do, they learn a lot. I will just quickly give an example. My first child, when he was one year plus, we were about to service a small generator. And the repairer came to the house. Immediately, Femi saw that the repairer brought out the small generator who were living in Ogudu. He quickly ran to the generator. He pulled the cable and just touched the generator with a cable. He then pulled, pulled the string as if he, was, he wanted to, to start it. The changeover switch was out of his reach. He now pointed to the changeover switch. Now, I never sat him down to say, look, this is how to operate a generator. He has just seen me doing it several times and he decided to, to, do, to, to follow suit. Somebody was, sent me a WhatsApp of a baby of, a baby of about uh, maybe nine months. And the baby saw the pause of his father and he opened, he opened his, his own T-shirt and started taking money from the post and keeping it here. I'm keeping it there. Now, who would have thought that? <laughs> who would have done that baby? <laughs> who would have, that baby must have seen that action being done by somebody. I don't want to. I don't want to. <laughs> I don't. I don't want to mention names. Teach a child the way he should go, and he will not depart from it. Praise the Lord. Dancing, the grinding. That one, I will explain by saying, we should follow the example of Abraham. Abraham. Now, the Lord said, I know Abraham, for he will command his children to walk in my way. To walk in my way. And then to do justice and to do judgment it was for a purpose so that the covenant I have with him can be fulfilled it does not mean Abraham was perfect but in spite of imperfection he knew of the covenant relationship he had with God 
And he knew that he must put the tiny feet of his children on the way of the cross so that they will not deviate. Now, the Bible says we must know the condition of our flock. We are shepherds to these children. We are shepherds. If we don't know the condition, their condition, their hearts, their yearnings, their problems, and we just gloss over them, we will be just like roommates in the house. We will not know each other. So that uh, example you are saying, those, that daughter must have seen it somehow, somewhere. In school, there are things they learn which we must teach them to unlearn. And they will pattern their life after us. It is what they see, they learn. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Pastor Lalo, thank uh, you. Um, you know, I, I want to say something about this dancing. And I think sometimes we, we, um, the children are getting up to things that, well, we all gasp when they ask the question. But I'm sure that a lot of us must have done similar things when we were their age. And that is why we know. My father used to say that, you know, the schoolmaster was once a schoolboy. So there's nothing you can surprise him with, you know. Uh, he's been there, he's done that. So sometimes, we, you know, we need to just remember that God has preserved us till this stage. And pray that God will preserve our children through the things that they're going to go through or experience or have to deal with while they are out there. Because the reality is that they're going to be dealing with these things. Boys are going to try and take advantage of them. Things are going to happen out there. And you just have to give them a prayer cover, but also allow them to come and discuss that. Uh, don't let, you know, be able to talk to them about this thing. Don't sweep it under the carpet and say, oh, no, 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 that's rubbish, you know. Nobody here was born again from the womb. If you were, please let me know. But God knew you before you were formed in the womb. Amen. So he, and he preserved you to this stage. He will also preserve your children. You know, one thing I always say, I've tied my children to the altar with an elastic band. I've been praying that prayer for many years. In elastic band, you know you can walk away, but you will snap and you will bounce back. Amen. So that and that elastic band is the prayer cover that we keep we have on our children so that they are covered. They may not know it, but trust me, I know that they are covered. Amen. So if they seemingly seem to be straying, yes, of course, I will pray. Yes, of course, I will know do what I know to do. But I also believe God and I have faith that they will bounce back to that altar. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. So prayer is important as well. Paula? Um, I just wanted to um, take it from another perspective. I think that some things are biological, and we must recognize that they are biological. At 12, at 13, you will have certain desires. You would have, if she did not want the boy to grind into her, she would not be asking the question. So it's not so much about the boy grinding into her and whether it's right. It's the fact that she actually likes it. Or at least she wants to, she doesn't want to be seen as being square or being, you know, not with the program, so to speak. So that we have to recognize that certain things, certain desires come at certain ages. If by 10, and it's getting younger and younger, by 10, by 9, they're beginning to have breasts, their hormones are changing, they're having periods, the boys are having, um, I don't know what you guys call it, but stuff is coming out. You know, that's the reality of it. They have feelings. And when you shroud it in darkness, then it starts to become a monster. There have to be conversations. Somebody has to be talking to these young people about how you are going to feel, about the urges you're going to have, about the fact that when you have 10 friends and nine of them want to, 10 of them want to go in a certain direction, it's going to be very difficult for you to go in the opposite direction. And it is normal to feel that way. It is not unusual for girls to be attracted to girls at a certain age, but it doesn't mean that you are bisexual. The moment you demystify it, the moment you take the, hey, blood of Jesus out of the matter, then you can begin to have realistic conversations about how you are feeling and how to respond to how you are feeling. Thank you so much for that. So sometimes what we tell our children in the teens church is that um, a woman is a well and a man is a fountain. And if you don't cover your well, then you can receive the fountain. And then the result of it takes nine months. Nine months out of your life, do the math at this age. 
and then, you know, we can take it on from there. But we need to be talking to our children. We need to remove the mystery out of a lot of things and not put our hands on our heads and think, oh my God, this can't be happening to me. Praise the Lord. So I'm going to go back to Pastor Lalu. Um, I wanted to get away from the kissing issue, but every time we ask our children to write questions, it's always about kissing and having boyfriends. So I might as well just read this. I'm a 13-year-old girl. Is it wrong to be interested in a boy who wants to date me for unknown reasons? He compliments me, but doesn't want any sexual activity with me, and he convinces me of that. What should I do? The reason I don't want to involve my mom, this is the crucial thing. The reason I don't want to involve my mom is because she won't listen to me. And then she will punish me without asking or letting me explain. She'll just get mad. I think um, Sister Bala actually has answered that question. In terms of demystifying um, what these children are going through. Because as she said, honestly, you get to an age where you are going through these things. Your hormones are raging. The questions are there. The feeling is there. You know, so many times, um, as parents, as, as this question says, my mom will just get mad and punish me. Punish me for, I don't know, asking the question or for entertaining the boy's question. I don't know. And a 13-year-old boy that is already telling you he wants to date you, but he's not interested in any sexual activity. How does he know that... Uh, you know so obviously that's where he's going you know it's his strategy and um, you know men are be boys they have strategies and don't pretend that you don't know about it we all know it you know we've all been there we've all been teenagers before so really let's not make our children feel as if we haven't been there or ah really you know or be shocked about these things when you know you've been through it yourself and I remember when I, uh, when I first started having my periods, it was actually my dad who sat me down and told me about the birds and the bees and told me not to allow any boy to touch me or don't allow any boy to deceive you. And if anybody does, tell me. And of course, that was my own. That's all I needed to hear. So anybody who didn't give me what I wanted, I would tell my dad that he was trying to touch me. <laughs> you know, but sometimes I think these conversations have to be had. You know, and... Um, Let's not sweep it under the carpet. You've been there. I mean, sometimes I look at myself and I know that God definitely delivered me from so many things. It's like he literally just snatched me out. You're not going to make that mistake. You know, things that you could easily have done. You know, we all went to school. You know, bodies who were abroad, there was really no, no supervision. You know, but the Lord preserved us through all that. We could have done so many things and had damning um, consequences, you know. And you don't want your children to learn from their own mistakes you want them to learn from your own mistakes but sometimes they insist on learning from their mistakes and sometimes we need to let them learn from their mistakes and just pray that it doesn't have any dam lasting damage on their lives thank you pastor lalu i.e we need to be talking to our children and nothing is trivial everything that is important to them must be important to us thank you um well let me ask you this question i'm a boy i'm 11 years old i'm in year seven i wish my parents will listen to and trust my opinion i think they should listen to me generally i wish they would tell me how much they love me and take me out to lunch That's uh, a child who is lonely in the family. That's what he is. He's lonely in the family. They are, they are in the house, but they are not connected. And so the child is lonely. Um, I think that if we don't give our children a voice in the house, anywhere they have a platform and they have a voice, they will use that platform. And God have mercy that that platform is not the wrong one. Um, rather than just, you know, being a generalist, let me suggest something that families can try. I, I used to do it with my children when they were young. Um, well, it depends on the... When you're, you have teenagers, you've got to have objective conversations. So it's not about you. You've got to find a way of raising topics 
that are general. You know where you're going, but you want to see how they feel about stuff. So there's something we do at our school, and most families have adopted it. We call it community meeting in school, but you can call it family meeting, where you're generally asking three questions. The first question is, um, does anybody have any acknowledgements? It's a way of being thankful. So what are we thankful for? What am I thankful for? And so you're sharing. I'm thankful for this. I'm thankful for that. I'd like to acknowledge you for helping with this. I'd like to acknowledge God. So how you teach children gratitude to God. The second question is, does anybody have anything to share? And that's when you throw out the question, oh, I was watching the news today. And I, I found out that um, Ireland just legalized abortions. And that's when you start talking about how everybody feels about abortions. And that's your opportunity to teach without seeming like you are hitting your child on the head with a sledgehammer. And then the last question is, does anybody have any concerns? And it's from there that you see the anxieties. It's something to do. We, 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 I made sure that we had dinner together every night, no matter what time. So you sit down, and while you are eating, you have very good conversations. And you, if you have teenagers, you want to make it about, you know, whatever is happening. At that age, your children will generally think that you are stupid. It's just their way of finding their own truth. And so they're going to reject everything you say, but you keep teaching, you keep throwing it out there. And through those conversations, you are sowing the good seeds that will help them in their moral formation stage, so to speak. One day they will come back to those values. So have conversations with them. You'll be amazed at their perspectives. You'll be amazed at what they see. That's the family meeting. And then every week, every week, don't let a week go by without having one-on-one -on -one time with every one of your children. And then you begin to see not just your family, but each child for himself. Private moments. Go for a drive, go for a walk, go for ice cream. And it helps you build trust. And you must develop the poker face. No matter what they say, you can go and cry to Jesus when you are alone, but you keep a very straight face. Thank you. <laughs> it means that parenting is hard work. It's not easy. I remember my son came home from school, A-levels, and then he said to me, Mommy, there's nothing wrong with smoking marijuana. I have done my research. They told us in school, in fact, it builds your brain. Yes, it took me a week to debrief that mindset because he had his points, he had done his research true, and he was ready to convince me. So my next question was, have you tried it? He said, no, not yet. Ah. <laughs> now, I decided to pray because, you know, but it was an ongoing thing. So our children go out, they meet people, they go to school. They are brilliant, intelligent children. In our days, if your daddy said, don't do it, somehow you didn't do it. You were, you, you, you were scared. Well, somebody said she doesn't know. But, but you know, to a large extent, you didn't do it. In this generation, you have to explain why. Why they must not do it. And you better have your strong reasons. Because if your reasons are not strong enough, if your reasons are not stronger than their friends' reasons, you are out. And they probably won't tell you another thing. Because in their opinion, you are not too intelligent. Do I have a witness? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Yes. I just want to give you a personal example about the importance of communication between children and, and parents. Actually, everything hinges around communication. Once it breaks down, enmity will result naturally. Now, I had a very good relationship with my, with, my, with my father. And how did it start? When I was in Form 1 in 1970, Government Secondary School Ilori, I didn't finish my pocket money. So I went to National Bank and deposited the balance. I got a form. Sig uh, form for signatory. On getting to Lagos, I told my father, I said, I didn't finish my pocket money. And I wanted to be a joint signatory to my account. He paused and then signed. Now, until he died, he never withdrew any money from my account. 
and it was a, it was a secret to all my accounts, even my business account. When I got married, I simply told my wife, I said, my father is a secret to my account. Now you two come and join. And the three of us are at liberty to sign singly. The second example was when I was in school of architecture, ABU. The first year was very, very tough. We did a design and I got 47%. Now, in those days, students of architecture and building, we do the same course. It's in part two, you now separate architecture line, building line. So after the first, first year, I came back home, I told my father, I said, I am no longer pursuing this course called architecture. I said, look at what I score in design. How did he handle it? It was just through friendly conversation. He knew I love Chinese food and the shrimps. So he took, he took me to Bar Beach then, and after walking along the beach, we ended up at Federal Palace Hotel. And he gave me Chinese food with shrimps. It was when we were eating, he then raised the topic again. He said, in building industry, who is the leader? He said, is it the architect or the builder? I said, ah, the architect. He now said, why do they want to be the tail and not the head? He said, look, you will resume two weeks before time. You will resume, go on holidays, I'm sending you back to ABU, you will resume two weeks before time, go and meet your design lecturer and ask him what was wrong. And I have enough faith in you that you will turn 47% to 74%. Now, that, that confidence and that love was actually what propelled me. Two weeks before normal resumption, I was back in school. And I went to my design lecturer. I said, look, I'm turning 47 to 74. What did I do wrong? It was actually a very small mistake. And honestly, that was what enabled me to end up with first degree, second class of art division. It was just that slight communication. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Thank God for fathers. So I'm going to read out another question quickly. I'm 11 years old. I'm in year 8. I can't tell my mom. I'm a girl, female. I can't tell my mom my problems because she shouts at me anytime I try to tell her things. She always complains that I talk too much. My mom also compares me with other children who get 90% in school. And she expects me to read all my books, 15 subjects, in one weekend, mommies. I hate it when my mom shouts at my dad too. That's question two. It seems like my mom doesn't care about me. All she wants to be, all she wants is to be regarded as the mother of the child who came first. Plus, she promised that if I came first in my class exam, I will travel. I did, but my mom didn't keep her promise. That discouraged me, and I haven't been able to score more than 80% since then. Also, I was bullied in school, and when I told my mom, she just told me to focus on my studies. Sometimes I wonder, and then she left dot, 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 dot. So this child has a lot of issues against her mother. And I, if I highlight them, her mother doesn't respect her father in her presence. Her mother doesn't respect her. Her mother doesn't keep her word. Looks like her mother dominates the house. Pastor Lalu. There's so many um, issues. And this is an 11-year-old girl. I.e. secondary school, year 8. What was that, form 2 or something? Form yeah, 1. Eight, form two. Form two. Sorry, in our own days, we do from one and two. I don't know. I have to calculate every time they say yeah or something. For an 11-year-old girl to be going through all this, and she comes to church and she has to write it all down, um, I don't know if the parent of this child recognizes themselves from these questions. And one thing, the strain I see in all these questions, my mom shouts, my mom shouts, my mom shouts. I think moms, we need to talk to ourselves about this shouting gives you high blood pressure 
the main issue for me here is the comparison to other children and then the not keeping of promises well i don't know whether it was a realistic promise that okay if you come first you will travel and then she came first and she didn't keep her promise so an 11 year old that's a big thing but to the mother who made the promise at the time she made it let me just say it so that she can do well she never had the intention of keeping that promise first of all it has financial implications so she probably could not keep that promise even if she had wanted to but this is something you could actually sit down and discuss with the child and not to make empty promises because we tend to do that a lot you know promise our children something for something and they keep their part of the bargain and we don't comparing them to children who get 90 percent have you everybody's parents got 90 percent or 100 percent anyway and they were always first in class um so i don't know who was ever second in their class everybody was always first but you use this as an incentive you are trying to actually give the child an incentive to do better but there are better ways of putting this across you know you can actually say that you know i didn't do that well in school and i want you to do well in school you know and it gets to say your children think that they know more than you anyway it's going to come to that stage they're all 15 going on 40 you know and sometimes i've had to tell my children you know i went to school as well you know you can't you know you're nodding over me as if i didn't go to school i went to school i went to university i'm a lawyer I what so you know but they think that they know more than you and you know sometimes i i know that i said things to my dad you know when i challenge him and he says how dare you and i say well you educated me so i could give you my opinion you know please don't follow that example <laughs> you know so i mean i really don't know i don't know if anybody else has an opinion on this i think the shouting and keeping of making yeah. promises that you're not going to keep i think we should as parents not make promises that we can't keep never mind that we won't keep if you can't keep it don't make the promise if you won't keep it then explain to the child i was just going to say something um, um earlier on that we talked about which is around uh, the kissing and all of that because i think as men as well that's important to talk about so what i do with my um, children my son and my daughter is to say look I ask the question, have you ever seen anybody kiss with your hands at the back? Um, and the answer is no. I say, so that's the first step. So essentially, we have to tell them that this, thing, this, this is the way this thing works. Uh, they're still quite young. They don't know. I was wondering if that's 12 or there about. Depends on the age. asking those questions. But let them know from your experience that, look, like my wife would say, every young boy doesn't have blood in his body. It's just to run that he has that doesn't have blood. Any, that all those boys you are seeing, there's no blood. All that they, all that's inside their body, it's just a testosterone. That's all they have. So know that when they tell you, no, uh, I'm just taking you out on a date. So, no, 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 that's not true. This is what's going to happen. And so when the parents reinforce that, that's my point. The, the, the father and the mother need to bring their experiences together and say, here's what happens. Here's how boys behave. And I'll tell my children, because I wasn't born again at that age. I tell my daughter, this is how boys do. This is how, you know, and now that I'm a bit older, they'll actually confirm that indeed it is true what you said, that that's how people behave. So we need to be able to explain to them that this is how we used to be, this is how things are, and let them know that, look, nobody's going to kiss you with their hands behind their back. The hands are going to be going all over the place, and the next thing is, okay, let's move it to the next phase. We've been kissing for one month now, let's move to the next phase. We need to talk about these things, because that's how it is. Praise the Lord. Just a short uh, addition, and it's in the area of communication. Um, there's a proverb in Yoruba that says, Pele olako olabo. The same thing may mean different things de depending on the way you, you, have, you have expressed it. Now, if I just step on your toes inadvertently and I say, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I hope it's not hurting too much there is a response which I will receive. If I just say, help my leg, what did you now? Why did you put your leg there? Well, it's the same thing I have said, but the, 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 the receiver will, 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 will act differently. And the Proverbs 15 verse 1 tells us that a soft answer turns away rough. A soft answer. But a harsh word brings anger. Praise the Lord. Thank you very much. A soft answer turns away rough. I think parents need to mind that. And I was also going to add, mothers, please don't shout at daddy. 
I think sometimes a lot of women think they are more spiritual or they are faster or they have more insights, they are go-getters and their husbands are a bit laid back and so there is a tendency to want to pull him by the nose. Children see it, they don't like it. It's a lesson every woman has to learn. If you are not doing it, praise the Lord. But if you have a tendency to do it, please let's stop it thank you very much okay so i'm going to read another one quickly because we don't have the luxury of time my mom is always finding faults it is not nice to know her she is always shouting we've dealt with the shouting bit mommies please stop shouting she doesn't say anything good about me i have no bond with her She's always beating me. Do I have a father? I want to know who my father is. I have never seen him. Finally, I just want to stay away from home. Anybody wants to answer that question? Asawoni. <laughs> well, the question of... Uh the mother always finding fault. Now, I will just say, First Thessalonians 5.21 says, we should prove all things and hold on to that which is good or which is true. There is nothing that hurts a child more than wrong accusation. When you now accuse him or her rightly, she will not even comply because there has been a built up anger that to have been accusing her wrongly. And I, there's another question which I think you will soon get to too. Uh, and that is one of the children accusing the parents of being blamed for the fault of her or her older siblings. They are in the same category. So please, yes, children will have their fault, but let us find out, first of all find out what the real culprit is and deal with that person and with that fault, not, not uh, make it escalate to other siblings. Okay. Uh, thank, you. thank you. But what about this child asking, do I have a father? Obviously that question was from a child of a single parent. And um, sometimes single parents need help. They need help because I mean, that question just made me make my heart goes out to that child because she feels she has no bond and she doesn't really have anybody else. And the mother probably also is, doesn't have anybody else and she's in a situation where she, she needs help. And I think women, you know, when you need help, try and reach out for help and not take it out on the children. Because when you, it, there's lasting damage when you do that. And then to rebuild the relationship with the child becomes even more difficult after that. Yes, there's a, um, well, two things. The first thing I'd like to talk about is vision. With the question of shouting, I'd like to go back to it. It's something I call visionary parenting, where I ask parents to picture your child as an adult. So your teenager now, in 10, 15 years' time, is entering the workforce, is considering marriage or in a relationship. What kind of human being do you want that person to be? What are the attributes? Maybe choose five, six, seven, ten, whatever. And then ask yourself, how do you produce that kind of human being? I'd like to also look at the data. How many people have ever said, I am who I am today because they shouted at me? I don't know that there's any measurable proof of fruit that is born from shouting at people. It doesn't bear fruit. It doesn't, after a while, actually, they, you get tuned out. If you ever want to know, just pause in the middle of your shouting and ask, what did I say? You're going to draw a blank because if you're always shouting, they stop listening. So what kind of human being do you want your child to be in the future? What is the best way to produce that kind of human being? You're going to find two things that you're going to need. You're going to need wisdom and you're going to need time. And remember, you cannot reap where you did not sow. If you do not sow the time now, you're going to reap a headache. If you do not apply wisdom, it's not about just throwing scriptures at our children. I am a firm believer in the word of God, but 
how do you wisely apply those principles to somebody who doesn't if i if you tell your child god said thou shalt not fornicate it's not going to kill the desire to fornicate how do you use wisdom to help your child understand that that is god's best way for you and any other way is going to cost you and finally for the father issue um it's so critical there's a scripture in malachi i think it's chapter 4 verse 4 it says before that dreadful day of the lord i will send elijah so that he can turn the hearts of the children to their fathers and the hearts of the fathers to the children lest i come and smite the earth with a curse and you wonder why is the father relationship such a big deal to god that he's willing to curse the earth without it because god wants to be known as father and for a person who a physical father is a bad word then the relationship with god as father is going to be very difficult in the future so it is either we help our children form good relationships with their father or we find a father figure who they can call father perhaps is an uncle a safe person no because some uncles do some strange things but every human being needs a strong and good representation of the word father it will affect the relationship with god as a father sometime in the future praise the lord hallelujah it it means that as parents we do some should i say subliminal things that children hear they hear our actions they just don't see they hear it and they hear it loud and clear so if a mother is disrespecting her husband if a mother is always shouting looks like it's only women today that are getting the bashing but you know maybe that's the way god wants it it means that we need to take thoughts look back and um check check ourselves so that we don't sell the wrong products to our children amen i'm going to read this other question quickly i'm a 17 year old girl i have a boyfriend but i respect my dad a lot so i don't want to tell him because he's a little bit strict am i right uncle ted um, I think his relationship that, that you've had from so at, at 17, pretty much she's it's out. Okay. She's uh, she's old uh, enough. She's, no, I mean, she, if you don't have a relationship at, at, at 17, you, you've lost it. Is, is my okay. point. Uh, so I think if you don't have that relationship, you have to just do a lot of work to build that relationship. Now, whether she's old enough at 17 to have a, 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 a boyfriend, I mean, so I'm very conservative when it comes to things like that because he only ends up in one place. Seriously, because what are you going to do at 17 with this, with this boyfriend? Are you going to be discussing biology or chemistry or uh, chemical engineering? No. It's, you're just going to have, have sex with this boy. That's what it's going to be. So I think it's, it's backing off again to, before they get there, having those conversations about what does this thing truly mean? You know, when you, what does a boy-girl relationship really, what, what does it do? What do you guys do? What do you guys talk about? So I wouldn't say, because when people say, okay, we're going, um, I have a date. What are you going to do at this date? Because people say, oh, I, I have a date. Okay, so tell me about this date. What do you do when you go for this date? Are you going to just eat food and come back home? No. And that's why I go through the whole thing about, okay, the first day you go for a date. Oh, can I have a, a peck or all, all of that? And okay, no, no, that's not a proper case. You know, so you explain these things to them. And then when, the, when it plays out that way, they come and tell you that, you know, you are right. That's what really happened. You know, you tell them all the tricks, how they, they'll drive you and the car develops a fault along the road, you know. Tell them all of these things. They say, eh, you know, because that's how they respect you that, okay, they can tell you some of their own things that are going through, you know. So you have to do that. I mean, there's an argument of my son and I or my wife and I on the same side. He's on a different side about growing beards. When I was growing up, he, you know, like he wanted to grow beards. All his friends had grown beards. So I said to him, he said, he had a small one. I said, shave it. He said, no, he's not going to shave it. Like, if he shaves it, it won't come back, you know? And we went on the argument for a long, he went to, of course, went to the internet. He said, it doesn't make any sense if you shave your, your beard, uh, that you should keep it. And I said, no, shave it. We went back and forth. So now that he's grown a bit of beards, we still have the argument. I said, but see, when you shave it, it comes back. My point is, they will argue with you. There are things that are going through. Talk to them. Talk to, they may not listen to you, but after a while, after a while, it will come back. Those of us who are parents here, there are things your parents said to you 40 years ago, 20 years ago, that still resonate. You know, so the fact that they're not responding immediately doesn't mean they're not listening to you. 
you know but don't t turn it into like a you know a sing song every day no tell your own stories let them know your stories how you struggle with these things and how you came out of it and then they will they will uh, follow yeah. amen thank you so much because of time and i want to say at this time please if you have questions the ushers will be passing it around we can't pass microphones around today but if you have any questions um the ushers should send the papers around and then we can collect and then see you know if we can answer the questions one day is not enough to actually deal with all the questions we had like seven pages of questions that the children um, sent to us so i'm going to ask this one quickly i'm 12 years old i want my parents to talk to me for example on how to talk to guys and how not to get distracted by boys i think we've done a bit on that i'd also like them to be a bit calmer on issues and listen to me i do not like to argue with them and I really would like them to stop telling me to keep practicing my instruments. It is stressful. So I'm going to add another one. There's another child that wrote, please, I don't like my lesson teacher. I have lessons all the time. Can I have some free period? Those are the questions. So I'm lumping those two questions together. Lesson, six days a week. I only get a free day on Sunday and then I can do my assignment. Does anybody want to answer that question? Pastor S? The pressure is out there. If she's not doing it, all her other classmates are doing So the parents feel the need for that child to also have lessons because the competition out there is fierce. But I think there's a way to balance it out. Um, I want my parents to talk to me. I think we've answered these questions on how to talk to a guy. This seems to be, a, all the children are asking the same questions, you know. Boy and girl issue seems to be an issue. I guess it's the reality of life. It's, and it's something we need to also concentrate on as parents because mistakes are lasting when it comes to things like that. Um, praise the Lord. I'd like them to be calmer over issues and listen to me. I don't like to argue with them. So parents, be calmer over issues. You know, there's, there's a scripture in the Bible that says, in Isaiah 54, verse 13. And it says, And all thy children shall be taught of the Lord, and great shall be the peace of thy children. And I think that that should be a key scripture that we should anchor on as parents. Because I always add to this scripture, Great shall be the peace of thy children, but great shall also be your own peace concerning your children. Amen? Amen. So if you teach your children... Great will be their own peace, and great will be your own peace. You know, there's uh, Yoruba say that um, entoba. What's um, what's the word now? Entoba first me. You know, you need to teach your child. You know, teach your child so that you can have peace. Amen. Amen. And it does not mean that what you are teaching them is going. It's seemingly going in through one ear and coming out of the other. But I believe that something sticks in between there. There's so many things I was told when I was younger that now. I'm recalling those things. I think, ah, it was so true. If only I had listened then. So, I, I, you know, your children already think that they're wiser than you. We just have to pray. And I, you know, honestly, I have nothing else to offer but prayer. And, let, and that prayer is what is going to see them through. That Lord will preserve them through the ups and the downs, through the challenges they're going to face in school, the challenges they're going to face in the workplace. The challenges don't go away. Even we as adults, we still have challenges in so many, in so many areas. You know, it's only the Lord that will preserve us through them all. Amen. 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 Yes. The, the question. I was just going to make a comment about uh, what, what drives us to push these children to this 90%, 100%, lessons, all of these things. And I think a lot of it is really ourselves. Uh, like one of the child said, is, uh, uh, the, the mom wants to be known as the, as the mother of the one who collects the, all the prizes. Um, and I think, you know, the Bible says in Second uh, Timothy uh, 1, 12, it says uh, that he's able to keep that which I've committed to him. God is able to keep that. So the question is, have you truly committed that child to him? Because those of you who send your children to some very fancy boarding schools, once they get in, you can't take them. 
you've committed them to those, to those schools, and for the period while they're in school, the, the, the headmistress, whatever it is, they are in charge of those children. Can you leave God to be in charge of your children? Can you trust him that he will take them? Because there are people you know who made first classes and who went to very good schools turned out to be real rubbish. And the people who didn't do so well turned out to be. So again, I, I tell my children, not because I don't want to, to get a good degree, but a good degree doesn't make you in life. It's connecting to God. And I tell them my story. That it's not what, who I am today is not because of the school I went to. And I didn't, I didn't do badly. But it's because of the God that I have come to know. So stop pushing them because you can push them and they will cheat in exams or do everything because that's what you're looking for. So ask yourself, what is really driving you? Give your children care of the Lord. Psalm 127 says, um, a watchman, you can watch all you want to do. It is the Lord that watches over that city. And it goes in verse 3, it says, Lo, children are a heritage of the Lord. They are just there for you to take care of. So don't turn them to become your own pride. Things you couldn't do. Push and push and push. And this is where the friction comes. So parents, ask yourself really, why am I pushing for this? Is it God's excellence or my excellence? Thank you so much. I'm taking the last question now. I'm going to, you will answer so you can... Okay, so I'm, and I'm going to read it quickly. And I want us to take this on because I think it's crucial. I'm 15 years old. I'm a boy. My parents get angry. What he actually wrote is, how come you get angry and you're not supportive of me when I'm questioning you about my sexuality? Is drinking right? How would you feel if I masturbated? Is God truly real? Then how come bad things happen in people's lives? Is elixir sex avoidable? He's 15. Okay. Um, if I can just latch on to the previous question and then talk about that. So, I'm a teacher. I'm in education. And so, this matter of tests and exams and pushing and flogging and all those, you know, high intensity parenting. I, I think we should look at our country because that's the fruit of the flogging and the testing. I think it is a, a prime example of the fact that flogging and testing does not produce intelligence, does not change the world. If it did, Nigeria should be, we should not be looking for global, what's that thing, top 20, 20, 20, 20. We should be right up there. Because when it comes to high stakes testing, I think we are, for after India and China, I don't think we, you can find people as driven as us. Where is the fruit? There's also statistics that show that all the people whose God is are going to end up working for the people who God sees and bees. So I would encourage us as parents to find our children's gifts very early and help them to develop those gifts. There's some basic academic knowledge that everybody has to have, but if your child has an area where he's excelling or she's excelling in their gifts, then their self-esteem is intact while they are busy struggling with some subjects because the reality of it is that most of their ability in school is genetic. If, if, if you have um, um, parents with um, low IQ, both of them, and it's in the DNA, that your child is going to be scoring 100% will require probably studying 24 hours a day. So let's be realistic. It is genetic. Science has proven it. There is a range during, you know, through which you can improve, but the core of it is genetic. So don't kill the child to become what he is not. Let him excel in his gifts. Okay. Thank you. Then the question of masturbation. Um, I hope the Rechabites in the room will forgive me because this was a conversation we used to have a lot in the Rechabite classroom. And a lot of them would come to me after, I think that's where I really developed the poker face, after fellowship and say, Auntie, I can't stop masturbating. In my, in my head, I'm like, hey, Jesus is Lord. But you know, you have to keep that straight face. And I found out that it was really common. In fact, I would say if I pick 10 boys here or 10 men here and say, if you have not masturbated, sit down. I probably won't find any. I can bet. So there's the biological part of it. And when you are talking to somebody who's struggling with it, there's no point denying that the urge is going to be there. How do you cope with it? What are the consequences of masturbate? You need to help them understand that number one, it objectifies the people who are going to come into your future. If you, you, if you see sex as something that is just purely for self-gratification, 
you will not be able to relate well with your spouse. It's going to cost you because sex is sacred. So recognize the struggle, help them understand the consequences, and help them understand that it's really a social problem. The more isolated you are as a person, the more likely you are to masturbate. So what do you do when you are tempted to masturbate? distract yourself, you go out, you engage in social activities, and then the devil doesn't build castles in your head because you are alone. And then of course, if you don't want it in your mind, don't put it before your eyes. So what are you watching? Give them strategies for dealing with the temptations of life rather than freaking out or just pretending that if, if I don't see it, then it doesn't exist because it does. Thank you so much. Should I say sad to say? We have to end. We have come, I think we even overshot our time. Um, I have some questions here. Um, I think with pastor's permission, we will have another time. And this time it will be from the parents. Now we've had from the children. We know that parents also have their struggles. I had mine when my children were growing. I told my daughter that she looked pretty and she said, only in your eyes. You are the only one that thinks so. And, you know, and that was because she had been hearing things that were negative and I had to debunk it. But believe me, it wasn't easy to do that. Um, I just want to encourage us in closing that we need to strike a balance with our children in bringing them up. And you cannot parent your child in absentia. You have to be there for these children. They are future. I always say to them, you are the future of Guiding Light Assembly. You are the future of Nigeria. And whatever we put into them today is what, is, is what we are going to reap in our old age. I heard an old man saying that maybe his generation was cursed because he looked after his parents, he looked after himself, he's looking after his children, and if he's not careful, he's going to have to look after his grandchildren because he had not empowered them properly to look after themselves and take responsibility. Um, thank you. <laughs> I don't know what else to say. Thank you for watching today's sermon. Subscribe now to get an update on when the latest sermon arrives.